Uh, thank you all for joining us. I was uh, recently informed of some breaking news in Raleigh regarding some uh, uh, other issues, and uh, I know that many of our regular callers have had to be on the, got called onto assignment over the last <coughs> 30 minutes, so I, <coughs> I appreciate those who have joined us. Uh, just very briefly, we've had a uh, We've had a, a good month of, uh, of, of keeping the public purse. Uh, we issued uh, tax-free bonds uh, at 2.8%, which was 2.84%, which is lower than what we were, should have been entitled to with a AAA bond rate because the demand for our paper is so strong. Uh, secondly, we reported uh, pension earnings but in addition to reporting those, we highlighted the fact that uh, the pension plan on average has not earned its assumed rate of return for the last 20 years. Fiscal year ended 2018. Uh, so the pension plan has not earned the assumed rate of return. We just got a, a CEM benchmarking report in that shows that the cost of administering the plan, not the cost of funding it, but administering it, <coughs> was the uh, either the lowest or the second lowest in the in the, in the world in that regard. On the state health plan, uh, we continue to make uh, progress on the state health plan. Uh, we move uh, smoking cessation to uh, our uh, CBS Caremark, who's our PBM. Uh, the purpose of doing that is that we hold them responsible for drug adherence to the extent that they can be responsible for that. <coughs> Not only was that a right move for drug adherence, but it was also financially right move, saving uh, almost $500,000 a year. And lastly, and we're in the uh, eighth inning of this, we announced that we uh, are freezing uh, all premiums for next year for state employees and retirees. And uh, we've got a couple more announcements coming out along those lines of some other contracts we're working on. And then we'll <coughs> go into our fall uh, operational uh, open enrollment season. It's a very complicated pension plan terms of its size and complicity. It's a even more complicated state health plan. And just to remind your, our listeners that uh, uh, the state health plan has nearly three quarters of a, of a, a billion, a million participants. And last year we had nearly 170,000 life-changing events. Deaths, births, divorces, marriages, dependents becoming 26 and 45 other kinds of reasons and so when you have that many life-changing events inside of one of the largest health plans in the United States it uh, gives me an opportunity to thank all the staff not only the pension plan but the state health plan for the work they're doing. All right we'll go ahead and open it up for <coughs> questions. Um, who'd like to ask a question first? Hazel? Do you have a question for the treasurer? Okay, do we have any other callers who've got a question for Treasurer Falwell? Hazel, did you drop off? Okay, we'll wait just a moment and see if anybody has any more questions. Hey, this is Jeff Moore with First and Freedom. I've got a question. Hey, Jeff. Hi, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I just I wanted to hear a little bit more color on the, uh, the returns um, kind of versus the market and those benchmarks there and what you expect going forward as, as we look at the market in the past couple of years obviously is screams higher and I imagine there's been some changes as far as the way uh, these pensions are allocated among different assets and these different vehicles how does that affect performance in a in a market that's screaming higher at, over the past couple of years and how does that affect performance going into possibilities for market downturns that, that we may encounter in the, the next couple of years. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, simply put, and I'm sorry I don't have the graph in front of me, uh, we have all the asset classes broken out. Uh, so we have real estate broken out, uh, private equity broken out, uh, and in a, in a bar graph. And uh, we'll be glad to get that to you. Secondly, if you look at our, how our consultant uh, benchmarks us versus other plans. This plan has all, if, if there's four squares on a piece of paper, this plan has always been sort of by itself on the top left, which means that <coughs> the risk that we take is never as great as some of the risks that some of the other plans are taking. Uh, 
and my point of saying that to you is that means that when the markets are screaming we uh, we lag and when the markets collapse we also lag um, but uh, I think our performance uh, re reflects the conservatism with which we run the plan we have never uh, been in better position in terms of the complexity of the plan as we come toward the end of 2018 uh, nearly 45 percent of these plan assets are going to be managed internally either in terms of the fixed income which has always been managed internally and then the nearly 15 billion dollars in passive equity investments as far as the other investments like uh, private equity uh, hedge funds alternative investments uh, real estate timber venture capital all those other things we're generally speaking uh, we're getting more distributions back to us than people are calling the money away from us. And uh, Jeff, just to, to reiterate, when I was sworn in, the plan had nearly $11 billion of what we call uncalled capital. These were commitments that had been made by the previous treasurer, which the checks had not been written yet. So that's what I mean by money not being called away from us. <coughs> Money's coming in faster than we expected from all these other alternative investment groups. <clears throat> and money's being called away from us into these same types of investments slower than we anticipated. Jeff, did you have a follow-up question? I do. Yeah, sorry, I stuck on mute there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, you also, in the most recent release, when you're talking about these returns, mentioned that the average return over the life of, of the pension kind of ticked down in a way that was a little bit concerning. Is that a function of the, these last uh, eight uh, years or so, 10 years or so, of, of lagging a market with a more conservative plan? And do you anticipate those numbers uh, kind of ticking back up as far as the average return? Or do you anticipate having to get an approval for uh, a further lowering of the expected return um, uh, to make those numbers uh, uh, a little bit more compliant with each other in the future? Great question, Jeff. Lowering the investment return has nothing to do with how the fund performs. The And I, I say this and it never comes off as politely as I intend it to. Uh, the stock market doesn't care what my needs are. <laughs> the bond market doesn't care what my needs are or the real estate market. The market is the market. The, ver the returns that we will get are the returns that we will get. To your point is when we lower the assumed rate of return, that is a funding issue, which means that when we lower the assumed rate of return, the amount of money that the General Assembly <clears throat> and all the state agencies and the cities uh, legal municipalities, county commissioners, and all the above, the the opportunity uh, when we lower the assumed rate of return, they have to put more money in the plan. So that's how those, and then ultimately, Jeff, those two issues come together in something called an asset liability model. So that's where the assumed rate of return starts to match up with how much we're actually earning. So the point of the press release was to point out to people like you, and thank you for picking up on this, is the fact that there are some who don't think that these numbers are real. That, that there, there's some, we're just saying that this thing hasn't earned the assumed rate of return for the last 20 years. These are CAFR numbers, Certified Audited Financial Reports of the State of North Carolina for the last 20 years. These are not Dale Falwell numbers. Or my administration's numbers. These are numbers that have been in the oven for 20 years. And if you step back and think about what's happened the last 20 years, it's, it's understandable. Uh, the market was very high in 1998. Uh, it kind of kept uh, at a high level in 99. Uh, <clears throat> and then we were hit with um, our country being attacked at 9-11. You know, stock market was closed for several days. Um, and then about this, as soon as we got out of the 9-11 situation in terms of the value of the plan, then we were hit with a recession of 08. <clears throat> so all this is kind of predictable or understandable when you look back on that. But I'll, I'll say, as I have said, 
the plan has not earned its assumed rate of return on average in the, for the last 20 years. I don't think it's going to earn the assumed rate of return over the next 20 years because I think the challenge to earn money on assets this large are tremendous. And last thing I'll say and open it up if you have another <laughs> follow-up. <coughs> this year, in the first six months, the plan paid out almost three, over three billion gross in benefits, paid out over 300 million in Wall Street fees, and the earnings have been basically flat for the first six months of 2018. That's real money. Jeff, yeah, one more follow-up, yeah. if I'm able. Yeah. Yeah. As far as the data uh, points that you guys have for the expected future payouts, and the average age and, and closeness to retirement of state employees, people that are going to be t uh, calling upon those pensions and those funds for their retirement, are there any uh, kind of bulge brackets that work through over the next few years, especially as we're seeing in the larger labor markets, the, the baby boomers moving into retirement, does the state employee complex have any bulges of a similar kind that's going to put more strain on the pension um, as far as uh, higher payouts uh, in the next 5, 10, 15 years? Or is there anything you anticipate on that end? Well, I'll, uh, I'll answer that as the treasurer, and then I'll answer it as a as as Dale Falwell. Uh, before anybody in this room was born, there was a term called this is your sign. Your sign of when that bulge will happen is when I can no longer ride, ride and race motorcycles because I'm on the tail end of this bulge. <laughs> so when I'm too old to ride or race motorcycles, then you'll know you're, I'm sort of the last group that's coming through because I was born in 1958. But you're exactly right. We do have numbers regarding this. We'd be glad to share them with you. Uh, to put a number on your question, we're paying out gross uh, over six billion dollars in benefits this year out of the total retirement system, and that number is going to be going to nine billion gross over the next ten years. And we can get you the specific numbers. So you can see, if hey, you, thank you. you can see, Jeff, if you have one year of no returns just no returns not negative returns just no returns and but you're paying out bet gross between six and nine billion dollars you can see how quickly a hundred billion dollar pension plan can start to get in the trouble that some of the states are in of course yes thank you yeah we're always and I have a, go ahead go ahead thank you. good morning well i did have a question about all that extra money this uh, the uncalled capital but my first question is when is your next motorcycle race uh when my wife says it is it's something i have to uh i was uh i was two-time state champion in this deck this in the last 10 years and i was uh national champion four years ago and so uh, I thought it had left my mind, but it, it it's uh, it's getting it's getting stronger. So uh, <laughs> I, I I feel like I'm in the best physical condition of my life. It's it's not I'm not in racing condition. It's a whole different level of conditioning. But uh, it's something I enjoy, and it's a it's a it's a great sport. Some would call it dangerous, uh, but you're either living or you're dying, Hazel. <laughs> Okay. Well, back to the money. Uh, you mentioned that you're getting more distributions back. $11 billion in uncalled capital for what? Now or this fiscal year or what? No. When I was sworn in, I think we had close to $11 billion of uncalled capital. So, oh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> and obviously some of that's been called. Uh, we've gotten some, some major distributions. But generally speaking, uh, in this calendar year, uh, people are crystallizing, as you know, Hazel, covering this nationally. People are crystallizing these assets. Uh, companies are going public. Companies are being folded. Strategic acquisitions merged. All of the above. So, uh, generally speaking, our our the amount of money we're receiving from these investments is uh, is over what we projected, 
Mm -hmm. And the amount of money that's being called away from us is a little less than what we projected. And we can break that down by asset class. But does that change your portfolio? Does that change your your asset allocation now or going forward? It, it doesn't. It It's not causing me uh, to change it. It's obviously something that we we look at but the 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 uh, but for a couple of percentage points here and there on some things uh we uh the strategic uh asset allocation hasn't changed since i've been the treasurer we okay. you know we, i mean we have targets we have ranges uh we have statutory ranges we have internal ranges uh, and as far as i can tell we're pretty much keeping the ball yeah, you know, keeping the car in the lanes for most respect. Obviously, our bond portfolio is what's really uh, weighing us down right now, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's no secret to anybody. We probably lost 200 basis points in uh, in performance last year, and 200 basis points on 40 billion, uh, 35 billion dollars. You know, it's that's that adds up. So. Uh, obviously, if you're if you don't have to sell bonds, which we don't, and if you're able to ladder and take advantage of these higher interest rates, then eventually the income off of putting money in bonds will start to kind of smooth that out a little bit. But I just uh, left the council of state meeting where every month I have to give an interest report, and the first interest report I gave, which was on short term interest that the state's paying was uh, 30, three quarters of one percent and the one I gave this morning is uh, over is almost two and a half percent that's what's happened since I've been the treasurer in 18 months okay thank you but for the uncalled capital that that just stays in the lane of that particular asset class yeah. right yeah and okay. And as we, you and I have talked about before, Hazel, and for uh, Jeff or anybody else that's still on the call, uh, there is a big difference between committing money to an investment and it getting committed. Meaning that some of these investment horizons are for three, four, and five years. So we can tell you, Hazel, we're going to give you a billion dollars to manage, but it's not in the you know, it, it's not being invested. That investment can take three, four years at least. Mm -hmm. Now, when you when we commit money to the passive in, internal index fund, it's uh, it's right there. I mean, it's it, it's in the market, so to speak. It, it's it's instant. So, we everybody talks about vintage investing uh, or vintage capital commitment, meaning you. You put money, you commit money every year to certain types of investments, but in many instances, uh, as you too well t know too well, just because you commit money to a manager doesn't mean they put it to work. Okay, thank you. But 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 it sits there in that asset allocation model as if it's being put to work. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thanks, Hazel. Do we have any more questions for the treasurer this morning? Yeah, I have a question. This is Mark Terzak from North Carolina Health News. I just wanted a little more detail on the, the state health plan and and how exactly, uh, you know, in sort of the rising health care costs, you were able to freeze premiums this year. Right. And tell me your first name. Sure, it's Mark. Are you the new Rose? <laughs> Uh, I guess I, maybe I am the new road, yeah. Okay. Uh, you got big heels to fill. So uh, anyway, uh, thanks for calling in, Mark. Uh, the way we were able to freeze premiums is we took advantage of our largeness. We had a fantastic negotiation with United Healthcare on our Medicare Advantage product. Now, okay. just, a, just a few years ago, Mark, there were none of our retirees that were on Medicare Advantage. Zero. Right now, we're bumping up against a 90% market share with nearly 140,000 participants. So from zero to a 90% market share is big, and we're trying to take that to 100. The reason that's so important is that 
when people are on the Medicare Advantage program with United Healthcare, there are no deductibles, no co-pays, and because of the freezing of the health insurance tax, which you know I've been working on with Congress and the President for 14 months, uh, did not get it done for 18, but I'm still hopeful. Uh, the result of all that is is $55 million in savings off of that one contract for 2019. So what do you do with that money? You can put it in the solvency fund and start defeasing the $35 billion unfunded health care liability, which Mark, in case you haven't heard this, on a per capita basis, according to the Pew Research Center, is we're one notch below Illinois in terms of the severity of this problem. What we decided to do is what we did last year when we froze family premiums because, going back to Jeff's question, this airplane, the left wing is way down and the right wing is way up in the air and it's people my age that are on the left wing. <laughs> and we've got to balance this thing out with younger, healthier uh, participants. So we took the savings from the Medicare retiree, Medicare Advantage product with the contract negotiation with United Healthcare. <clears throat> and we chose to freeze all premiums for everybody else in the plan. Now, that cost probably 35 to $38 million of the savings that we got. Uh, we had a choice about what to do with that. All of these people, whether they're a dependent, a retiree, a retiree that's pre-65, or the people sitting in this room who are active employees, all of these participants in total spend over three billion dollars a year in health care. So I thought it was an act of good faith on our part that said that when we save money in part of the plan and we're trying to level this plan out and we give people the certainty of not having health care costs go up next year <clears throat> and for that we're asking them to be watchdogs because they're you know 1.5 million eyeballs on health in care, on health care bills, on health care processes, on not having somebody take an x-ray of your knee when the person that just referred you two hours before took an x-ray of your knee in the same facility. All those things is a message to me, to these participants, that as we save money in this plan, obviously we're going to try to make it solvent uh, as far as the unfunded liability, but we're going to continue to invest in our employees so that uh, they can have certainty about their health care costs. That's how we were financially able to do it. And I'll just say on the record, Mark, if I think it's unlikely, but I don't ever stop until the bills go out. If for some reason we were able to get the H health insurance tax put in the freezer for this calendar year, because it's not charged till March. If for some reason we were able to get that put in the freezer for this year, I could tell you right now that we'll be able to freeze premiums for 2020 also. You uh, can I ask a follow up to that then? Yeah. Of course. Yeah, uh, Blue Cross um, announced a program uh, just like three or four weeks ago that would entice people or incentivize people to shop for care for the lowest price. And basically, if, if people do that, they would be able to get uh, essentially cash back um, to that process. And that program, as I understand it, would be open to you know basically any of the large self-funded programs that Blue Cross administers. So that would, I assume that includes the, the state employee health plan. Are there plans to offer that incentive to state employees? There are plans to operationalize or take advantage of any idea that brings value to our participants and our taxpayers. Unfortunately, and I, I hope I'm not speaking out of school and somebody here will check and get back with you as soon as we're off this call if I am. Unfortunately, uh, we need to make sure uh, that Blue Cross is performing up to all the other aspects of the contract that we currently have with them. The transparency, whether the President of the United States said it two days ago or not, the need 
and the necessity and uh, and with making health bills more transparent have been on the laws and in the on the books for years no one's done it no one's operationalized it and mark i don't know where you shop but let's just assume it's harris teeter i don't suspect you would go back to harris teeter if there were no prices on any of the product in the aisles you wouldn't that that's what our consumers deal with they don't know what the price is and furthermore and you're about to see some news uh, out of us over the next eight days about this subject furthermore we get presented with bills and we're not we don't know what we're supposed to pay we just know what the bill says it'd be like you just going to the grocery store and then getting a credit card bill at the end of the month and just having no clue about what you were supposed to pay you just know what the final charge was we can't be in that uh, in that business anymore and the thing I sort of stumbled on a while ago mark and I'll, I'll open it up for another question if you have one uh, the thing I was stumbling with is that the if I'm correct, the feature that you, which was the premise of your original question, the Blue Cross Blue Shield did not offer that to us for free. I think okay. they, I think they offered that to us as an add-on to our existing TPA with a PMPM PM, uh, calculator on it. So, so it sounds like there are some discussions ongoing with Blue Cross about the way they handle billing and uh, explanation of benefits statements? Yes. And okay. we, we're, we've redesigned the state health plan card, which their name's on the back, not the front, because they don't pay the bill. Right. And it says paid for by you and taxpayers like you. We're about to roll yeah. out the new explanation of benefit that explains the benefit of things. We're coming out with an employee benefit statement that shows the true value of what uh, taxpayers like the state employees are putting into the system on their behalf every year. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing all of those things. But at the end of the day, we need to have the price on the product in the aisle. And my optimism, and my voice and body language never gives off much optimism, my optimism is that if people, they're, 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 as, as Popeye once said before any of you were born, I can't stand it because I can't stand it no more. That was one of his famous sayings. People are sick and tired of cons spending 20%, in many cases higher, 20% of their income on something they don't know the value and the price of. People are over it. They're tired of it. And as the biggest purchaser of health care and pharmaceutical benefits in North Carolina, we have a, an opportunity to do something on behalf of these participants and the taxpayers of our state. Is that going to happen soon, next eight days? Is that what you're talking about, or is, is that a you mean, longer term? You mean all those three things? Well, I mean, particular being able to allow it, it, as you say, to sort of allow people to know the price of what they're purchasing before they purchase it, right? Um, before I get my x-ray, I can, I can know what that's actually going to cost, so to speak. Well, there's two things going on. One is for you to know as a consumer what it's going to cost. So we're going to be developing a list of... <clears throat> no more than 10 questions that everybody should be asking as a participant in this plan before they engage in the health care system of, of our state at any level. 10 basic questions. Not all the questions will apply to whatever they're getting involved in. But people like having a list of things they should ask. <clears throat> so that's on the watchdog side. What I was referring to earlier is getting a copy of contracts I live as you know literally between Forsyth and Babbitt's Hospital literally between mm -hmm. and between my house and here there could be as much as a 40 percent difference on knee replacements of hospitals of the same quality between my house and this building in Raleigh but nobody knows that <laughs> nobody knows where those price points and where those qualities are and it goes back to Mark, something I've talked to Rose about. Everybody talks about medical tourism and you know the fancy topic and it's written about in Governing Magazine. We have is, I want to visualize, I want you to visualize something for a moment. We have as much border with other states as California does. 
It's amazing to think about that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Borders with other states. My point of saying that to you is that we're big enough, we have enough people, we have enough money, we have enough needs, and we have enough medical providers. We all be able to do medical tourism inside the state of North Carolina without having to send somebody to Tempe, Arizona, or Singapore. We can we can do this, and we can lead our way out of this, and that's why that's why we do what we do every day. Is trying to figure out. The is, is there a time frame on that, though, to sort of allow people to, you know, as you say, right, uh, a knee replacement, the cost can vary a lot depending on, I mean, heck, you have to drive across, halfway across the state, you just drive across town sometimes. So is there a timeline for when a state employee might actually be able to figure that out and make a choice based on that? Do you want some breaking news? Sure. Yesterday. That's the timeline. <laughs> I mean... Every day that this happens, every day is a lost day. And <clears throat> I can tell you that D. Uh, Jones and the rest of the folks at State Health Plan, in addition to negotiating contracts, going through open enrollment, all the other complicated things that we do at the State Health Plan, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're trying to get our data warehouse so it'll talk to us. And mm -hmm. We have spent millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars in this building on data, and it doesn't talk to us. Now, it doesn't need to talk to me because I'm the least technological person, you know, on the planet right now. But it, 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 we need to have data that talks to us. I need to hit a button and exp tell me who's prescribing opioids, who's filling opioids, and who's consuming opioids. I need to hit a button that says, how much money are we spending on average in the last 45 days of our participants' lives into care? There's lots of things I dream up in the middle of the night that I would like to hit a button on and let the data talk to us. Because until you resolve these issues, and you're not going to make any headway on any of these subjects. So on one hand, giving the consumer the information they need is vitally important, but that runs parallel with us knowing by seeing the contracts, what we're really supposed to pay. Any more questions, Mark? No, I think that's it for the moment. Appreciate okay. it. I appreciate you uh, being on the call, Mark, and hope to meet you sometime. Yep. Do we have any other questions from anyone else on the call? Okay, great. We'll go ahead and have the treasurer make yeah. a few closing remarks. Thank you uh, for your participation. Um, we uh, we continue to do what's figure out what's right, get it right, and keep it right, telling the truth, doing the right thing, hoping the chips fall where they may and should. Uh, I want to go back to Mark's uh, comment because Blue Cross did put out another announcement about actually lowering premiums. That was on a, a obviously a large book of business, but there were so many actuarial, statistical, and financial aspects of them having the ability to do that. It, uh, I can tell you that freezing all premiums for one of the biggest plans in the United States uh, from our standpoint was Herculean and it, if it can be, if, if you can point to one thing it's because we're signing our contracts and not other people's contracts and that's how we were able to do that and I appreciate all the hardworking staff that uh, put this together today, the participants on the call, and uh, as I've uh, told you before, our, our mind, our hearts, and our uh, doors are always open to you.